Hi all, and thanks again for joining us for today's webinar on portable long service leave for community, um, for Queensland community services. My name is Kath and I'm one of the Sector Sustainability Coordinators at Community Legal Centres Queensland. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we are holding today's webinar in Mianjin, Brisbane, the Turuba, Turubal and the Yagara people. I pay my respect to elders past and present and acknowledge that these are stolen lands and that sovereignty was never ceded. As this webinar is being viewed by people across Queensland and Australia, I would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners throughout the country and extend a warm welcome to any First Nations people joining us today. So today we are very pleased to welcome Andrew from QLEAVE who will be talking to us about the ins and outs of Queensland's Portable Long Service Leave Scheme, employee entitlements and employer obligations. But before we get started, just a quick bit of housekeeping. Today's webinar is being recorded and we'll have the recording available to download from our website tomorrow. The links to the PowerPoints have been emailed out uh, to everyone who registered by yesterday. They're also available to download from our website and on the handout section of the GoToWebinar control panel. We encourage you to ask questions, so please type your questions into the question box on the uh, GoToWebinar control panel and we'll read your questions out, um, but that will be at the end. But please feel free to type them in as you think of them. So I'm now going to hand over to Andrew and I will talk to you all again at the end of the presentation. Thanks, Andrew, take it away. Thank you, Kath. Good morning, everyone. Wonderful to be joining you uh, for today's session. I really appreciate the time that you've given up to come and be part of today's session. Uh, thanks to the team there at uh, uh, the Legal Centres Queensland uh, for the opportunity to be able to present this session for you. We're going to run until around about 10.30. Uh, my apologies, uh, 11.30. It is just past 10.30 now. So we're going to go through until roughly about 11.30, but we're going to allow the last 15 minutes of the session for Q&A. So if you do have any questions that you'd like to offer us, have, uh, type them in the chat box or um, the ladies, Kath, uh, inclusive, uh, might uh, just read them out on your behalf anyway. Uh, my role at QLEAVE, I am the Senior Stakeholder Engagement Officer here at QLEAVE. I've been on board now for the last approximately nearly 12 years. And my main role is basically education. So I educate both workers and employers in the industry of portable long service leave about how the scheme works, a little bit of compliance to make sure the employers are doing the right thing. Uh, and today's session really is more focused, of course, on the scheme, the new scheme that we've been administering since the start of January 2021 for community services, employers and workers. Look, before I dive in, um, Kulu would also like to um, acknowledge the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as the traditional owners of this country throughout Australia and their connection to land and community. We'd also like to pay our respects as well to all traditional owners and to their elders, both past, present and emerging. So thank you so much everyone for allowing us to do that acknowledgement. Look, what is QLEAVE? We are known as a portable long service leave scheme throughout Queensland. We actually administer three schemes in total. It was set up back in 1992 for the building and construction industry. It was a thought from the building and construction industry that was lobbied through the unions and the government of the day back in the very late 80s. And it was set up to commence as of the 1st of January, nine, uh, sorry, 1st of July, 1990. And QLEAVE also provides a portable long service leave for not only community services, but also contract cleaning and building and construction. You can see there clearly contract cleaning was introduced back in 2005. Each of the schemes are govern, governed by separate legislation, which means QLEAVE is considered a state authority, a statutory authority of the current Queensland Government. And we have three separate boards for all these three schemes, all of which who report to those ministers that you can see there on your screen, Education, Industrial Relations and Minister for Racing. Just a bit of a scheme snapshot on the community services uh, scheme that has been in, a, in inception since the 1st of January 2021. 
Currently, we have a total of just shy of 98,000 registered workers, and that's courtesy of just shy of 1.4K registered employers. It is purely funded by a levy, an employer paid levy based on the workers' wages. So every quarter we require those registered employers to pay a, a, a levy based on the employee's ordinary wages. And that is in the form of that levy of 1.35%. And you can see there that just over $57.5 million has been collected from all of those registered employers since inception back in June, January 2021. You can see the top three worker types on our list. One, number one, alcohol and other drug services, accommodation support services in second. And in third place, we've got Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander and community services, but the list is very, very expensive. The scheme was introduced basically from industry um, lobbying the government back in 2017 or just earlier than that. So the Palaszczuk government back in 2017 uh, introduced or commenced uh, research on whether a scheme would be viable for the community services sector. And it was uh, initially lobbied in a way to introduce such a scheme to retain those very important skills in this particular industry of community services. It was an industry found to be very reliant on recurrent uh, rounds of funding. And because of the transient nature of, nature of the industry, um, obviously we wanted to, the, the initial aim was to ensure that we retain those important skills for this particular industry and provide some flexibility with their leave entitlements. And that's very much what QLEAP does in those two other schemes. And it's no, no different for the, for the aim to do that and provide that to the people in the community services sector. So that levy I did mention of 1.35%, it is subject to change. Um, and that usually gets uh, reviewed by the Queensland State Actuary. We invite them in every couple of years and they do some number crunching based on what monies we've got in the kitty versus what money that we would forecast what we would need to pay any claims. So, for workers in the community services sector to be registered, employers must be seen to provide a community service, whether it's all of their operations or only a part of their operations. Now, once the workers are registered, employers must register, or should I say report, their workers' ordinary wages every quarter. And that's to determine the kind of levy that is paid to QLEAVE. And that money isn't retained by QLEAVE as such uh, for our benefit, because we're a not-for-profit um, organisation. That levy is used to pay future claims. And the current levy rate, as mentioned earlier, is 1.35% is of workers' ordinary wages. Now, to break down what is a, an ordinary wage for a worker, uh, I will switch over to our website uh, towards the end of the presentation. I'll just show you where you can find further information uh, after today's session anyway. Now, the levies are collected and they're invested through the good people at QIC, the Queensland Investment Corporation. And they're given the responsibility to make sure that good investments uh, are upheld and that the funds are there waiting for entitlements to be paid further down the track. And those, those levies are purely to pay the workers entitlement once they reach a certain period of time. So after seven years in the industry, workers registered with the scheme under the community services banner can look forward to a little over 6.1 weeks of paid long service leave. And this is no matter how many employers that they've worked for over that seven plus year period. And that's one of the main reasons why these schemes are introduced for these industries because it allows those workers a little bit more flexibility rather than have to um, stay with the one employer for that period of time, normally 10 years. Most of us are aware that long service leave kicks in after the 10 year mark. But in this case, the under the legislation, workers registered with the scheme only need to do seven years in the industry and then they can start claiming just over six weeks, 6.1 weeks of paid long service leave. Now, I, I must stress, um, that QLEAVE doesn't replace any kind of long service leave arrangement that's already in place under industrial law. We basically 
are there side by side with whatever an employer has in place. We're, we're there to cover the worker in case they don't stay with their employer for the required period of time. Um, we have seen and uh, experienced different EBAs uh, where workers don't necessarily have to work with one employer for 10 years. Sometimes contracts or EBAs only require a worker to stay five years uh, or less than 10 years to be with an employer to claim long service leave. So I've got some case studies coming up towards the end of the presentation uh, for in total, which gives four different scenarios. And hopefully those case studies and scenarios will put a lot of this information I'm giving you now, hopefully we'll put it a little bit more in perspective anyway. And if it doesn't, please don't feel confused or, or, or lost. Uh, there's plenty of opportunity to ask some questions at the end of today's session. And if we don't get a chance by 11.30 to go through all your questions, um, Kate, uh, Kath and her team will send them on to us and we'll reply back to you uh, um, in, in good time anyway. So again, yeah, seven years of service, 6.1 weeks, roughly accumulates at the rate of 4.3 days of paid long service leave that the worker can claim for us. So essentially when you're in, in the timeline of things, we're not expecting any worker claims until around about 2028. But in the interim, employers who are paying out long service leave directly to their workers, because maybe your worker has been with you for the required period of time, for example, say 10 years. In some of these scenarios, we'll put this um, into perspective, but you might have workers still coming to you to claim their long service leave prior to 2028. And it's not a case of that the employee or worker can claim from both. It's Generally speaking, it's one or the other, but there is also an opportunity for employers that are registered with the scheme to claim a reimbursement within three months of them paying long service leave to their workers. And again, these case scenarios that are coming up will hopefully put that information into perspective as well. Okay, for workers, this is basically how it works. They're required to register through their employer. There's no self-registration uh, availability for workers uh, at the present time. I'm not aware of anything in the pipeline coming up that they can do that on their, on their solo, but they must register through their employer. And again, if the employer is deemed to provide a community service, then they are required to register the workers that are on their payroll, that are on their books. It is meant to be an all-inclusive scheme, which is fairly broad, but we're requiring those employers to meet their obligations with the scheme legislation and, and register their workers with QLE and that registration process can be done online. We've got a general number of 1300 QLE that's available for all people to contact. We've got some very knowledgeable staff on that line that can help you with your inquiries. Of course, I'm, availability, uh, I'm available for a, a direct contact as well. And Kath uh, there at the team can certainly pass it out if you need to reach me direct. Secondly, step two, the employer again every quarter needs to pay a levy to QLEAVE at the rate of 1.35% based on the employee's workers' ordinary wages. And we work off a credit-based system. So basically, as you can see there, one day in the role is basically one service credits. And after seven years, um, you get so many service credits, which in turn will turn into a long service leave entitlement of that 6.1 weeks. Now, every year, QLEAVE under the legislation is required to send their workers, their registered workers, a statement, giving them a bit of a snapshot of what's taken place the previous financial year. And that normally, that statement normally goes out normally towards the end of the year. But part of my role and message to your workers is that we don't want them to wait for that statement. As soon as they've got registration confirmation from QLEAVE, and that normally comes in the form of an email, we encourage your workers to get online, get registered for online access and take, take charge, take control of this, take responsibility for their, their long service leave accrual through the scheme. And they can very easily do that via the online portal, which they can access on their phones. It'd be great during their breaks, weekends, after work, they get curious about QLEAVE. They don't have to wait for the 1300 number to open at nine o'clock the next day or on the Monday if they're doing it on the weekend, they can certainly get on their phones or on their laptops or home computer and they can get on and get a current snapshot of their QLEAF. 
and it, it keeps them in in link, I guess, with uh, you know how how their long service lead through us is actually accruing. And of course, once they've reached seven years in the industry, regardless of how many different community service providers that they work for, they can come to QLEAD directly and they can claim their entitlement of 6.1 weeks. They don't have to claim it all in one hit. They're not required to claim it dead on seven years. They can claim it any time after the seven year period and they're only required to claim a minimum of five days. So anything over and above five or more days, they're welcome to claim. But again, another important message to your workers is that when they claim it, they must they must be claiming it with the intent of taking the leave. It's long service leave, not long service keep working. So we'd like to take them a nice like like them to take a nice well earned break. And the wonderful thing about long service leave is that you don't have to, in our case, after the seven year mark, you don't have to do another multiple or another set of seven years to enjoy another six point one weeks because the seven year mark through our scheme for this this scheme for the community services sector, a bit of a line in the sand. It means that every year that they remain in the industry, another 4.3 days will accrue in their long service leave entitlement with the scheme. And they've only got to have a minimum of five days in their kitty and they can pop another claim in any time they like. They don't have to wait another lot of seven years to do so. So it's just initially that, that seven year mark uh, that we get them to aim for. There is provision for a worker to pop their queue leave on hold for a period of time. If for whatever reason, they might wanna go and try something else in another industry, they might be off work injured or unwell, maternity leave, study, overseas holidays, around Australia trips, whatever reason, you get my drift. They can pop it on hold for a period of time and have that flexibility of coming back into the industry, picking up from where, they're left, where they've left off. So, and again, these scenarios that are coming up very shortly, will pop that into perspective anyway. So for employers, or both workers and also employers can use the online portal to maintain their QLEAVE registration. I did give it a bit of a plug in the previous slide about how workers would really encourage them to take, take charge of their QLEAVE. We don't want them to just feel like it's set and forget, you know, and that everything is automatic um, running away in the background. We wanted to make sure, because if it, what one employer will do in, in in the right terms for them, they might go to another employer that may not be up to speed with what their reporting requirements are. Um, and especially you might have situations where the employee and the employer may not get on and things might become a little bit lax based on our experience that we've seen in the industry. Again, the important message for the workers really take charge of their Q leave because we don't want it to lapse. That's another thing too that we'll, we'll mention in the scenarios coming up that you know we certainly don't want it to lapse after a period of time because that could mean cancellation, which could mean a couple of big hoops to jump through for the employee or worker to try and get that reinstated. Look online, the employers basically can do everything, report their quarterly returns, register, cease workers as they're coming and going, you know, short term, long term. They can update workers' details, such as mobiles, emails, addresses on behalf of the worker. And again, the unique thing about this scheme, unlike other industries that I'm aware of, that employers registered with the scheme can actually claim back long service leave that they end up paying their worker. So they have a period of three months from the date that they pay their workers the long service leave entitlement. And you'll find that that'll be the case between now and 2028. Because 2028, line in the sand, that'll be seven years from inception of the scheme for the community services industry. So 2028 is when we expect to start seeing worker claims directly from the worker to QLEAVE. And workers can claim online or they'll be able to claim online. Um, but in the interim, uh, where workers are able to claim their long service leave directly from their employer, that employer has got that three month period from the day that they pay their work of the long service leave. They've got that, that time frame to claim that back uh, from QLEAVE as a reimbursement. One of the scenarios, we'll put that into perspective as well, but key, key point here is that you'll only be able to claim a reimbursement as far back as when the scheme commenced back on the 1st of January, 2021. Workers again, can check their entitlement anytime, 24 seven online, and they can see what service has been reported from their employer. And if there's a scenario or a situation where 
the employer is unfortunately not doing the right thing by the worker and hasn't lodged the quarterly return and the service on behalf of the worker. The workers will be able to see that and they'll be able to report that to QLEG so we can give them a hand to stay and check with their employer. We might be able to give them a bit of a helping hand and contact that employer and just help that employer along the way and remind them of what their obligations are. And we get that in this industry being so broad and range, such a, a broad range of community service providers out there that not everyone's going to get on board this immediately. As much as we have all those registered employers, you saw the stats earlier in the piece, there's still people out there, employers out there that may not know what their obligations are. So we're very lenient um, and provide that education piece to help them do the right thing on behalf of their workers. And of course, workers, once they've reached that magic seven year mark in the industry, and if they haven't claimed already from their employer, they can claim directly from QLEF and there'll be availability that they can log on via their online portal and claim their long service leave directly from us. Again, minimum five days, no maximum, as long as they're prepared to take that time off what they claim. And it is taxable income and we'll take our tax, pop that net amount into their bank account. Normally within five to 10 working days, we can have claims paid directly to the workers. Of course, our, our claims people try and get them through as quickly as possible. But you'll probably find around Christmas and Easter time, it does get a little bit busy trying to process claims in time for the popular time leave times of year. Uh, but the worker, again, can find out from QLEV as to when, when to actually lodge their claim. My understanding is that workers can pop in a claim at least one month prior to when they want their leave. Um, so everything can be in place and there's a bit of peace of mind for the worker. Before I start scenario number one, we've got one of four scenarios coming up. I just want to mention that what we pay the worker when they pay, when they when they claim their long service leave from us, a formula is used by QLEAVE, which includes every quarterly wage that has been reported by their employer and every quarterly wage for the period of that seven years or more is used as part of that formula to work out the payment to the employee or for the worker. So it won't necessarily be based on that last or that current wage by the worker at the time that they make the claim. It'll be included along with all those other quarterly reported wages. And we send both the employer and also the worker information detailing what has been paid, because we certainly want the employers to be notified that we've paid their workers long service leave so that the employer can then amend or adjust their long service leave uh, records. Uh, and that's to ensure that the, the worker doesn't claim from, from both, both sides of the party. There's certainly no room for double dipping. So we want to be clear to the workers and the employers that it'll be one or the other. All right, let's, let's take a look at a few scenarios and hopefully it'll put a lot of this information into perspective. Let's introduce Jenny. Jenny's in the community services sector employed by company and community service provider ABC. And this is a scenario where Jenny is employed in the community services sector, both before and after the scheme with QLEAD has been introduced. And it's a situation where Jenny's actually reached her long service leave entitlement with her company in ABC. So we can see there, the timeline shows Jenny um, commences working with ABC back in 2015. Now in 2021, January, QLEAD scheme kicks off and ABC are right on the ball. They register themselves as an employer and they also do the right thing by Jenny and they also register her with the scheme. So side by side, QLEAD is there running along um, right by the entitlement, the arrangement in place, the long service leave arrangement that the employer already has in place under industrial law. So Jenny reaches, un under this uh, EDA or um, Act, it, means that Jenny can claim her long service leave after the 10 year mark. Uh, so in general sense, um, 10 years, one employer on wages, person can claim their long service leave. So 2025 comes around and Jenny is actually eligible to claim her long service leave because she's been with ABC on wages for that period of 10 years. So she's met all requirements under industrial law. 
However, even though Jenny and ABC have been registered with QLEAVE since day dot, the commence, commencement date of 1st of January 2021, Jenny won't claim from QLEAVE because she's yet to reach seven years of recorded service in the industry with QLEAVE. Okay, she's been in it for 10 years, but there's no provision to backdate any earlier, any service earlier than January 2021. Backdating an employer, a, a worker, employee's service only comes into play for any service after the scheme inception of 2021, January 2021. So any work done by a worker in the community services sector prior to 2021 won't be acknowledged by the scheme only after 2021. So Jenny doesn't miss out. She still gets her long service leave entitlement. She claims that directly from her company ABC because she's been with them for that 10, 10 year period. Now, the plus for Jenny's employer, ABC, is that they are now in a position, because they've been registered with the scheme since 2021, January, ABC is in a position where they can claim back an entitlement within three months of paying Jenny. They can now claim an, a, an entitlement backdated to the 1st of January, 2021. So even though ABC might have paid 10 years worth of long service to Jenny to go and enjoy a nice little break, well earned break, ABC are only in a position to claim back a reimbursement from us based on what they paid her under QLEAVE's formula for paying workers, only back as far as January 2021. Now, Jenny might continue working for ABC past 2028. So there'd still be some accrual uh, on a pro rata kind of basis after 2025, both with ABC and also QLEAVE. So if it might get to 2028 and Jenny might then decide, okay, I want to claim from QLEAVE. She can then have, she's got the choice then to claim either from us or her employer, because she's been with her employer for more than 10 years. She's got the choice. But normally what we say to workers is that if they're claiming from us, but they're also in a position if they can claim from their employer because they've reached the minimum 10 years, we normally say to them, look, check, this is what we would possibly pay you, but also check what your employer would pay you, okay? Because uh, other entitlements, things like superannuation might come into play. Uh, again, the, the key message there is that we just say to the worker, check from both organisations as to what they would get paid. Look, scenario, Jenny might leave ABC after 2025 and go and work for another community service provider, and she might get past 2028, and which means that she's still been in the scheme for seven years. She can claim, she can claim, she can come to QLEAVE and claim her entitlement from QLEAVE as of 2028. And one of these other scenarios might put that that, that last example in, into perspective anyway. Let's take a look at Dave. Dave is employed with multiple community service providers, both before and also after the, this scheme is introduced, January 2021. But he hasn't, he's not in a position where he actually reaches his longest service leave and time, say for example, 10 years with a single employer. So let's have a look at Dave's, Dave's timeline. Back in 2018, Dave actually starts working with organisation community service provider XYZ. Now he keeps working with them right through until 2022. Now, as of January 2021, his organisation XYZ, Community Service Provider, does the right thing by themselves and also uh, Dave, and they register with QLA in that, that uh, in January 2021. But look, as of 2022, Dave decides, look, I want to take a year off. I might want to do some further study. I want to might be some really good deals by the airlines. He wants to go and travel a little bit, take off in a caravan, whatever. Uh, or he could be unwell for a whole range of reasons. Dave decides to take a whole year off and he ceases working. He, he, re, he resigns from XYZ. So he's only done, say, four years. He's had a year off. And in 2023, Dave's all refreshed. He's ready to come back, utilise his skills that have been retained in the industry, comes back into the community services sector and he starts working with a different community service provider, ABC as of 2023. So Dave's had a year off, but that one year that he's worked in 2021, when he resigned, that actually is parked 
recorded and registered with Keyleaf. Those previous years won't count towards any kind of long service leave of time. But he's got one year parked with Keyleaf because it's been registered and recorded or lodged by his previous employer, XYZ. Dave takes a year off after he resigns from XYZ, which means he's got one year recorded already with Keyleaf. He needs another six years in the industry, regardless of how many different community services providers he works for. And then Dave then reaches a seven year entitlement. So Dave starts working with organisation ABC and he stays with them right through to at least 2029. So he's got another six years recorded service by his company ABC. Add the first year with XYZ, the other six years with his current employer ABC, bang, he's he reached his magical um, years of service of seven through our scheme. So Dave now is in a position that he can come to QLEAVE rather than his employer and claim his long service leave. So with, with his company that he started with in 2023, he might need to reach 10 years of service with them on wages for 2033 for him to claim long service leave directly through his employer. But because both ABC and Dave is registered with the scheme, Dave only has to reach seven years of service. He can claim his 6.1 weeks from us. We'll let his employer ABC know that Dave's claimed his 6.1 weeks from us. ABC will hopefully adjust their records. So that way that any long service leave provision that they put aside for Dave, they can wipe that off because we've already paid that. Okay. Dave might also have a position where he doesn't want to claim his long service leave from us. It means that he'll need to, if he wants to claim through his employer, he'll have to reach 2003, 2033, which is the 10 year mark. Now look, in, in the interim, he might decide to leave ABC and go and work for another community service provider. But the peace of mind for Dave is that because he's registered with our scheme, portability of long service leave, he just needs to get seven years accrued in the industry regardless of how many different people that he actually works for in the community services sector. Let's jump on to scenario number three in the interest of time. And we'll take a look at Sue's scenario. Sue's employed by community service provider DEF, both before and after the scheme, the QLEAF scheme was introduced back in January, 2021. Now in this scenario, you'll see that Sue only needs to reach five years under her EBA arrangement with her employer to reach her long service leave entitlement. So she, she doesn't have to do 10 years with this employer because there's different employment arrangements, different EBAs, et cetera. Sue only needs to reach five years with her employer before she is able to claim her long service leave. So, Sue commenced working for community service provider back in 2018, a few years prior to our scheme commencing. But again, another employer, DEF, sorry, this employer DEF has done the right thing by Sue and has registered both themselves as an employer and also registered Sue with a, Sue as a worker and they pay her the quarterly levy on her behalf um, based on her quarterly wages. So that again, it doesn't come out of the workers' wages. This is an employer contribution of the levy. Now in 2023, so the scheme's been in play for a couple of years, Sue is eligible to claim a long service leave because she's reached five years with DEF and that's a five year arrangement under that particular EBA for the company and its employees. So Sue's not in a position where she'll come and claim her long service leave from us because again, she needs to reach a minimum of seven years in the industry before she can claim long service leave from QLEAVE we're sitting there in the background. Sue might want to claim her long service leave after five years and she can go, because she's been five years already with DEF, she can claim directly from her employer, not from QLEAF. She'll need to wait until 2028 before she can claim any of her long service leave from us. And again, hopefully when company DEF pays Sue any long service leave, for the five years that she's been with them, DEF should advise QLEAF that they've already paid some long service leave. And normally when, when an employee comes to us and claims their long service leave, one of the questions that is asked of a worker is that has this long service leave already been 
being paid. So the worker needs to make a declaration that they haven't been paid for all part of that period of time. So Sue's can continue on working with DEF, or if she happens to leave them and go and work for another community service provider, she's already got two years recorded service with the scheme from 2021 up to 2023. So she just needs to reach seven years in the industry after that, regardless of how many different community service providers that she's employed by, providing a community service, and she'll reach a seven year entitlement with QLA. Again, another key message in this slide is that no service prior to 2021 will be recorded for QLE purposes. It's only from 1 January 2021. Again, QLE doesn't replace what's already in place with an employer under industrial law. Last scenario, Joe is a worker in the community services sector. He's employed with community service provider RST back in 2017. So up until 2021, January, none of those years or days that Sue has provided community service, that, that won't be recorded for QLA purposes, only after January 2021. So in January 2021, company RST, uh, community service provider, I should say, RST, registered Joe with the scheme. So she can have accrual through both her employer, RST, and also QLA side by side. Now, Sue's in a position where she gets to 2022 and she decides to, for whatever reason, leave employment with community service provider RST. So Sue, in this case, Sue needs to reach 10 years to get her claim a long service leave directly from her employer. And she needs to have seven years recorded service with QLA from January 2021 to be able to claim directly from us. So the scenario shows that uh, Joe only stays with organisation RST until 2022. So essentially she's got one year of service recorded with us. Now Sue will for, uh, sorry Sue, Joe, I'll get it, the names right. Joe won't reach a long service leave entitlement with her employer RST because she hasn't reached the minimum of 10 years required to claim her long service leave. So Joe, might leave and go and study uh, for a period of time. She might take time off from maternity leave. Um, she might be unwell, travel. Again, all those different range of reasons. But because Jo is registered already with a scheme, she's got one year par. She basically just needs to do another six years in the community services industry and have that six years recorded service by her community service employers, regardless of how many different ones that she works for in the industry in Queensland. Now, another message here is that when a worker leaves the industry, for whatever reason, they can do so, they can pop their queue leave on hold for a period of up to about four years. So within that four years, queue leave will still continue to send out yearly statements. But at the four year mark, what queue leave does, and we have to, under the legislation, is we have to communicate via email or letter to the worker to say, look, four years have gone by and we haven't seen any recorded service for you. Please respond to QLA within 30 days to avoid cancellation. So our message to the worker is that whatever you do, make sure you keep your contact details up to scratch, up to date, including mobiles, emails, and postal address, because we don't want to lose contact with the worker. Because a worker could be away for that four year period for whatever reason. It could be on the verge of coming back in the industry. Or they might say to us, look, I'm not planning on coming back shortly, but I am next year. QLEAF could be in a position where we could just pop her QLEAF on a hold for another year until the next lot of letters come out saying that, look, four years have gone by that we haven't seen any service recorded for you. So Joe's still in a position that she could still claim some long service leave directly from QLEAF as long as she gets accumulated seven years of service over whatever period of time she stays in the industry, as long as it doesn't um, doesn't get cancelled. Because if it gets cancelled, uh, a worker needs to reapply to a QLE or have to appeal the decision to cancel its registration. Um, and there's no guarantee of getting the, the, the initial registration reinstated. Um, our team here at QLE needs to look at the, the, the details surrounding why the, the 
the registration was cancelled to begin with. So again, very important that workers maintain their registration. Don't assume that the employers are going to um, maintain it or advise cure leave of a worker's movements anyway. Look, that's a bit of information to decipher from today, especially if you haven't already you know, been made aware of the scheme or it's only you know, been relatively uh, a new thing for you. But look, help is, is at hand. Um, our 1300 number, as you can see there on the screen, operates Monday to Friday, nine till five. We've got experienced client services officers that are able to assist you, or at least come back to you if we need to dig a little bit deeper and find some information to respond to your questions. Uh, the email is, of course, uh, like, like most things we do nowadays, we can shoot an email through. Might be quicker to try and make a phone call, you could get a, a slightly quicker response. Uh, emails do come through for all three schemes thick and fast, so it might be uh, a little bit longer before we can get back to you, but we'll certainly reply back to you. Now, um, what I'm going to do is very quickly, before we go into Q&A um, in a couple of minutes, I'd like to just switch over to our website. So bear with me while I do that. And I very quickly just want to show you what it looks like. And it looks a little bit different on your phone, but generally speaking, you'll still be faced with uh, or presented with these three tabs. And you can see our two other schemes on the left in green and blue, building and construction contract planning. Those things are handy to know in case you're going along to a barbecue and the topic of portable long service leave comes up and, oh, what do you do for a crust? What do you do for a living? I'm building construction, contract cleaning, community services. Um, did you know about portable long service leave? Certainly do your part and, and help spread the word and people get onto us and, and enjoy this wonderful flexible entitlement that they, they might be eligible for anyway. So under the community services tab, you'll see that there's information for both workers and also employers. And under the worker and employer uh, sections, you can see both have frequently asked questions. Wonderful starting point, just to go in, have a look, different scenarios for employers, information about claiming long service leave payments back, what employer obligations are, pretty much everything that we've gone through today in that 45 minutes will be covered uh, on the website. There's some new YouTube videos if you're one of those people that prefer to watch a YouTube rather than have to read War and Peace, but it's it's kept fairly general in sense. For the worker side of things, again, they've got frequently asked questions, uh, can find out whether they're eligible. There's a whole list of different community services that is um, given on our website that falls under the uh, CSI Act. So if you're one of those employers or workers that are, do I or don't I provide a community service, certainly start from there. If in doubt, give our, our 1300 number a call. So we've reached quarter past 11. So now might be a good time that I'll hand you back to Kate. Oh, to Kath, sorry, my apologies. And Kath can fire away any questions that you might have had for us during the session anyway. How are you, Kath? Great, thanks so much, Andrew. Um, we have had quite a few questions come through. Um, hopefully some of them have been answered as you've gone through those scenarios, but I'll start working through them and we'll see how we go. Um, okay. No problem. So, um, Edu, just a, hopefully an easy one to kick us off. Is it compulsory for employers to register their staff with QLeave? Thank you. Yes, it definitely is compulsory for an employer to register their staff with QLeave if the employer is seen to provide a community service. So, normally the services that are provided to the vulnerable um, society, uh, uh, members of society uh, are deemed a community service rather than if they're operations that are just open to the general public. So again, if they fall under the Community Services Act and they are seen to provide a community service, it is in Clause 3. They, they do have a legal obligation under the, the state government legislation and the Ministry of State. Sorry. Uh, that we administer are administered by, yes, they, they do have a compulsory nature to register their workers. But if in doubt, uh, we encourage those workers to call us if they have specific 
is that I need to clarify. It, it's generally meant to be an all-inclusive thing, yeah? Great. Um, we had a few questions come through around this. So does QLEAD interface with portable long service schemes in other Australian states or is it for Queensland community sector employment only? So at the moment, my understanding is, is that QLEAD is just for community, community service provided just in Queensland. We also are aware of community service schemes for portability of long service, both in ACT and Victoria. But my understanding is that that there's no current reciprocal arrangement, but something might be in the pipeline. It's a bit of a watch this space. So the scheme legislation and the schemes are actually communicating with each other on an ongoing basis. Not something in the sense, but something down the track might take place where service might be recognised in those other states and territories. Not at the moment. Only ACT in Victoria schemes in addition to the one in Queensland. All righty. Um, just going back to some of the detail in one of our scenarios, Andrew, um, are you able to clarify from scenario three how the calculation works for 6.1 weeks after seven years, given that Sue had only worked at DEF for five years? Can you explain how that calculation would have worked in that scenario? Yeah, so... Um in that scenario where Sue has only worked, or like has worked five years with her employer, but has only been registered with QLE for say two years, because I think if, this, if memory serves me correctly, Sue started in 2018, so by 2023, she reached a five years with her employer, but has only had two years recorded with QLE. So, Sue is in a position where she can either claim directly from her employer, at five years, 2023, or hold off and claim from us in 2028. But Sue was in a position where she wanted to, she's reached her, her long service leave entitlement under industrial law and that, that EBA arrangement, where Sue can claim her long service leave directly from her company. And they would, they would just use whatever calculations they would normally use to pay up long service leave to any of their workers once they've reached that five years. So I guess another way of looking at it is that if QLEAD didn't exist for community services, Sue could still go to her employer at the year five year mark in 2023, claim long service leave under their EBA and Act and or Act, and an employer would just use normal payroll calculations uh, under industrial law to pay that worker their entitlement. But no, no formula would be used from a QLE sense, because we're, we're not actually paying the long service leave entitlement. And even though Sue has had service recorded by her employer for that two years, that the scheme's been in, in like um, uh, underway, uh, no formula from QLE would be used. The, the quarterly wages that were reported to us or the levy that was paid, none of that would come into play when that employer was paying Sue her five-year entitlement. So basically the employer would just be fulfilling their long service leave uh, arrangements under, under industrial law. All right, thank you for that, Andrew. Um, are all SHAD's employees eligible for this scheme or are there other eligibility criteria that need to be considered? It, it doesn't. Not necessarily. Um, again, if if a worker is under under shads, again, we would need to look at who they're actually working for. We need to make sure that whatever work that they're performing is seen as a community service, and that the work that they that they're engaged or employed by that they're actually a community service provider. So my understanding is that um, you know whether they're under shads or, or not under that. Um, QLEAVE take a different view that we need to be seeing that the employer is providing a community service. Basically what I'm saying, we don't differentiate under what, what arrangement or what act that they come under for community services. We, we can see or view an employer as a community service provider and the worker must also be seen as providing a community service or supporting the provisions 
of providing a community service. Thanks, Andrew. So um, from an employer point of view, does the employer have to pay the long service leave um, when it's eligible under the QLeave criteria and then seek reimbursement from QLeave or can the employer request or require the employee claim it directly if they're not in a position to pay the amount up front? Yeah, it's, um, the way we look at it is really it's up to the worker or the employee, worker and or employee, I should say, um, as to who they want to claim from. If they want to claim directly from their employer, you leave no ifs, no buts, um, they can claim directly from their employer or they can claim directly from QLEAF if the worker insists that they want to claim from us rather than their employer. Um, the employer is, if, if the worker goes to the employer and wants to claim their long service leave directly from them rather than QLEAF, the, the employer must still meet their long service leave um, um, requirements under industrial law and pay that long service leave. And then they're in a position within three months of that payment to the worker to come to QLEAF and claim a reimbursement. Um, employers can direct, if they want to, their workers to claim from QLEAF. However, when the employee or worker, I should just stick to worker, when the worker comes to QLEAF and we've identified that they've been with their employer, you know, for say, the 10 years required for the worker to claim long service leave under industrial law, we will generally say to the worker, look, this is what we would pay you. Now go and check with your employer as to what they would pay you. And then we leave that up to the worker to make a decision as to which organisation that they claim from. Because again, the figures may be different what we would pay versus what the employer would pay under industrial law. So again, in short, it's really up to the worker as to who they choose to pay it from, but we'll only pay it to the worker once they've got seven years recorded service with QLEAVE. Anything less than that, we'll be instructing them to go back to their employer and they're only in a position to claim it directly from their employer if they've reached either in general sense 10 years or remember in Sue's case, she only need to reach five, uh, reach five years uh, under their EBA Act uh, to claim it under five years anyway. Thanks so much for that, Andrew. I think a lot of your answers to these questions are answering some of the questions that we have coming through. Um, because we do have so many, um, if anyone feels like we haven't answered their question, please email me after the presentation is finished and we'll get some answers for you as well. I just have a couple more here, Andrew, which hopefully we've got time for. Um, with the 1.35%, um, this may be on your website, but is that gross or net wage? Gross wage is where the 1.35% is applied. And again, on our website, the our definition of ordinary wages is broken down on the website, but it's based on their gross amount. Okay, um, and with the reimbursement for the employer, I think you went through this in a little bit of detail. Um, are they entitled, if the um, employee has met all of their employer's conditions as well as all of QLEAD's conditions, is that reimbursement 100% of what the employer has paid out or would it be pro rata under QLEAD's criteria? Definitely pro rata. Again, because we need to, we, we can only pay back long service leave based on what the employer has paid as far back as 1 January 2021 when the scheme was introduced. Um, and if a employee or a worker is claiming long service leave from QLEAVE, um, does the employer have any um, rights or obligations around permission or permitting the long service leave? So if there are contractual obligations around performance or any other outputs to be considered? That would probably be more of a question to, I guess, fair work or industrial relations because if a worker, um, if there's different requirements or arrangements between um, the employer and the worker whereby you know long service leave you know 
may or may not get paid in certain scenarios under certain acts, that would definitely be something that would need to be directed to the people at Industrial Relations or Fair Work Australia. Um, QLE wouldn't be involved in that decision. We, we're basically there to pay an entitlement based on those quarterly contributions over that, that seven year period. But we don't get into things like performance or, or contracts. We're more about, okay, the quarterly levy's been paid, the service has been reported for the worker, the worker reaches their entitlement, we're happy to pay out that directly to the worker or reimburse the, the employer if they're in a position to claim that reimbursement. All right, and we'll just finish on one last question here. Um, Andrew, what are your um, top tips to going about registering for QLEAVE? Top takeaways from today's session, have a bit more of a read on the, the community services sector section on the website. Feel free to give our people on the 1300 number a call uh, and mention to them that you were part of this session today because that's good feedback for us as to how the session went. And it also gives us an idea of the kinds of questions that might be trending from industry to help us with our future messaging. And certainly if you feel as though that you're should be part, you should be part of the scheme, definitely have a conversation with your employer and, and make sure that you know your discussions are, are documented with your employer about the decisions if, if you're not being registered and certainly include us in that conversation um, where you can um, in relation to any discrepancies or any any you know confusion or, or clouds that might be hovering over a decision making etc cetera, etc cetera. so we're there to help help with the decision making process especially but certainly get registered through your employer and take charge with with uh, online registration once you once a worker has been registered and take charge of us and just on that uh, cat too we, we certainly provide a free service. Uh, Queensland is all of our territories, so at any given time, it could be anywhere within the state. Um, we spend a lot of time, of course, in South East Queensland, so it's, it's, we have staff, inclusive of myself, of course, to come out to your workplace if you want a staff session or if your employers just want to uh, have a chat to us about the scheme, we're happy to provide that at no cost as well. Great, thank you so much, Andrew. Um, and thank you for your time and expertise today. And everyone who's joined us, thank you for your great questions and your engagement. I'm very sorry that we didn't get to everyone's question. Like I said before, if you don't feel like yours has been answered when Andrew's gone through the scenarios or answered the other questions that have come through, please send me an email and I will track down Andrew for an answer for you. Um, before you go today, please complete the feedback survey that will pop up on your screen once this webinar is closed. Your feedback really helps us improve our webinar program and bring you sessions that are relevant and helpful for your practice. We hope to see you at the next CLCQ webinar next week on understanding and centering community needs in a disaster with Dr. Kate Brady. Um, but that is all for us from today. So we will sign off and everyone stay well and we'll see you soon.